Development Lead. I'm also joined by our expert speakers, oncologist and author Professor Robert Thomas, <coughs> and Bao Winder, who has lived experience of cancer. We're really pleased to have you both with us this evening to discuss all things nutrition and lifestyle. Um, before we get started, a few bits of housekeeping. Um, the first half of the session with our speakers will be recorded for use on our website. So please turn your camera off and put yourself on mute. Um, if you have your camera on, we will assume that we have your consent to be filmed and put on our website. So if you don't want that to happen, then um, please turn them off and please keep yourself on mute as well. In the second half of the session, our speakers will be answering your questions. Um, we'll be taking questions initially from the chat. So please do just pop these in as we go along. The Q&A won't be recorded, so feel free to turn your cameras back on for this section. Um, just to note, this is a public forum, so we welcome general questions about the topic, but we're unable to answer anything relating to a personal cancer experience. So if you do have any concerns that arise, uh, arise as a result of today's session, then please do contact your healthcare professionals, or if you have any questions about cancer services, you can contact the East of England Cancer Alliances um, via the email address that you use to sign up for tonight. Okay, great, I think that's everything. So I will hand over to Professor Robert Thomas. Thank you very much, Holly. I'm just gonna go through the um, pathway of trying to get my slides up. Let's hope this is correct. So can you see my slides now? No, I can't see anything yet. OK, I just followed exactly the same pathway as last time. Maybe I should have left them up. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll turn that off and on. Maybe just by finding them again. Um, how about that? No, shall I just no. share them and you say next when you're ready for me to move on? Okay, that's strange because that was exactly the same pathway as before. Um, okay, so I'll share mine and then you can tell me when you're ready to move on to the next slide. Oh, there you are, you're sharing now. OK, so let's just get the map. Sorry about this, folks. Can you see them now? Yes. Yeah. OK, um, from the beginning. So thank you very much, Jane and Holly, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I'm a straightforward oncologist, I treat breast cancer, prostate, and um, a bit of bowel and skin. But we run a research uh, laboratory or research unit looking at sort of lifestyle strategies to try and find the evidence for what things we should do to help ourselves, whether it's cancer, sporting activities, or reducing many of the side effects of treatment. So I'm going to share, it'll be a little bit biased on what the trials we've done. So it, it, don't think that I'm sort of prioritizing these things over others. I'm sort of prioritizing the stuff which we've done, the actual research. Um, so first of all, um, the good news is that, um, well, I'm not sure if it's good or bad, the amount of people living with cancer is increasing significantly because the rate of uh, diagnosis is going up a little bit, but <clears throat> the chance of cure is going up uh, as well. Um, but not just that, if you have metastatic disease, uh, the chance of living longer has increased significantly. So for prostate cancer, for example, the predicted survival, if you, even if you have metastatic disease, is probably over 10 years and uh, the things for breasts have improved. So the amount of people living with the consequences of cancer treatments has significantly increased. Uh, but that means um, there's a lot of new um, symptoms you people have to cope with and many of the people watching tonight I'm sure are experts of knowing the side effects of treatments um, but there doesn't seem to be apart from Jane what she's doing is, is fantastic 
uh, there's there's still a lot of confusion, probably too much information out there on the internet of what to do about these chronic diseases and symptoms which are common after cancer treatments. So what we do as a trials unit, we've tried to look at the evidence from other sites and 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 present what we call scientific reviews, summarising the evidence and putting that into sort of bullet points we can share with charities and say this is what you should have in your information leaflets. We listen to patients and say well you know what are the things which are bothering you and we've learned a lot from our patients and uh, both in Cambridge and, and Bedford and then ultimately we do randomised trials and with that evidence we publish it, um, we write a blog and I've written a few book chapters including the treatment of cancer which is just coming out and this is my own book. Um, so hopefully we, you know, we, we gather our own information and look at evidence from around the world. So let's just start with exercise as I'm just going to sort of run through very quickly uh, the, the things which are most important after a diagnosis of cancer. And I would have to say exercise is most important. And the reason for that is there is a lot of interventional studies, so randomised controlled trials, which are the gold standards uh, trials showing that if you manage to exercise after cancer, you are less likely to be fatigued, you're more likely to have less depression, anxiety and a better mood and uh, your overall quality of life will be better. Um, obviously, it's hard work to exercise for many people. Uh, we also know from other studies that about three hours a week of getting yourself a bit breathless and, um, you know, sweaty, will reduce the risk of cancers coming back. So if you're in complete remission from, say, bowel cancer, breast or prostate, the chance of you relapsing three or four years down the line significantly drops if you exercise regularly. So it's a good thing to do. This was a study we did looking at people who are going for radiotherapy for prostate cancer. We looked at who exercised and who didn't. And actually, uh, exercise was uh, was the biggest thing which reduced some of the late side effects, such as rectal toxicity, incontinence, and erectile function. Um, and not so much in the NHS, although we're working on that, and Jane will probably verify that later. But certain private hospitals like Genesis, which are, there's 13 of them providing radiotherapy, they now have gyms next to the radiotherapy unit. So if you go for your radiotherapy, you actually go to the gym first, you exercise for 20 minutes and then you have your treatment, which is fantastic. Um, but it's, it has to be remembered that, you know, that exercise is not one thing. You've got to think why you're exercising. If you're worried about osteoporosis and things, you've got to do weight bearing exercise, squatting, and walking up and down stairs. If you're doing it mainly for stress relief, you know, it's good to have a bit of relaxation in. And if you're just doing it for weight reduction, then, you know, swimming and cycling. So the best thing is to have a supervised exercise program. And many centres around Europe are now have, um, they can refer their patients on. And if you don't in your area, you can ask the GP for an exercise referral to a local gym for 12 weeks, which is significantly subsidised. But it's not just about the actual exercise. This was a paper we wrote recently in the international journal Nutraceuticals. Now, if you're not used to exercise and you listen to my talk or listen to Jane or Holly and say, well, I must go out and, and, and work out straight away, you can actually do more harm than good if you don't prepare properly because you generate these things called free radicals, which can actually damage our DNA and our tissue, they can damage your joints, uh, etc. So you've got to prepare, first of all, you know, start gently and work up. But also nutrition is very important to have things they're called phytochemical rich foods. So, you know, beetroot, uh, tomatoes, um, cabbage, uh, fruits and berries, these are very important to, to have these before an ex and after an exercise regime so that you enhance your oxidative pathways, you protect your joints, you can actually improve um, uh, this thing called DOMS where you have uh, uh, delayed onset muscle symptoms um, and also they can help you sleep and, uh, if, and reduce fatigue and that will increase your motivation to exercise and also there's evidence that reduces coughs and colds which, which you have to stop exercising when you have a virus. Uh, so it's very important to think of nutrition as well as exercise. Um, so go, moving on to gut health. Now it's become very trendy now, um, but for very good reason. We, have, we are actually hybrid species. We have as much genetic material 
in our bodies and on our bodies from alien uh, path, uh, no, not pathogen, alien bacteria and viruses and yeast and things as our own. So it's not a surprise that these organisms have a very, very strong influence on our immunity, our, our reaction, our allergy to things, and actually cancer. Um, before we get to that, um, well, let's talk about the bacteria in our gut. So there's bacteria all over our, on our skin, in our airways, etc. But the ones we often talk about is gut health. So if we have abnormal, the, the wrong type of bacteria in our gut, we end up getting bloating, indigestion, we have to take omeprazole, laxatives, uh, so forth. And it's quite uncomfortable and that can be associated with fatigue, etc. cetera. Um, so you, most of the time it's pretty obvious if you have a bad gut health. But in terms of illness, we know that chronic uh, poor gut health can actually increase the risk of cancer and reduce reduce the risk of um, cancer treatments working effectively. They're also associated with a lot of conditions here, like fatigue, low mood, dementia, um, osteoporosis, hot flushes, weight gain. All these things are more common after cancer, and we know they're linked with gut health. So, you know, the trials have yet to be done, but it makes perfect sense if you have any of these symptoms, one of the first thing you do is try to improve your gut health. Um, so how does um, having an abnormal gut health or, 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 or a, an overgrowth of the wrong type of bacteria, we call them bad gut bacteria for the sake of argument. Well, these are the main mechanisms how gut health can uh, affect cancer. And I'll go through these in turn, but briefly it can alter the uh, integrity of the gut wall leading to leaky gut. It can reduce the response to, to treatments uh, and it uh, reduces the absorption and bioavailability of these things called phytochemicals, which I mentioned briefly about sports. And it actually affects vitamin D absorption. So this is your, this is, would be a normal gut, a nice, tight, healthy looking cells. And if you, have the, if you have too much inflammation caused by the wrong type of bacteria, gaps open in the gut and the the immune areas called payers patches shrink as well. So you get less immunity and gaps. And in those gaps, you get toxins leaking into the bloodstream and you get nutrients leaking out. And those toxins, when they go into the bloodstream, your body recognizes them as foreign and sets up an immune reaction. That, and that's called chronic inflammation. We need inflammation to heal cuts and things like that. But this is a different thing. This is called chronic inflammation. So you get a combination of reduced immunity and excess inappropriate inflammation. And that is a perfect storm for developing hundreds of symptoms and cancer. It also damages oxidative pathways as well. Um, so the other thing is that what most of, um, well, yeah, I would say most of oncology treatments are going towards these biological drugs instead of, say, chemotherapy. Now, biological drugs, one of the ways they work is to uncloak our cancer cells and make them visible to our immunity, and our immunity then kills them. So they're very clever, new, expensive drugs, which are getting fantastic results. But if you have a poor immunity, you have a 40% worse chance of responding to them and a much higher chance of getting side effects to them like lung toxicity and diarrhea. And this has been proven in many studies now. So uh, many of the large organizations like MD Anderson, where the best hospitals in America are actually doing prehabilitation programs where they're getting people to have good gut health before they start these biological agents. And if any of you listening are on them, that's another good reason to look after your gut health. We also know that poor gut health, uh, if you have prostate cancer, will increase the risk of cancer. But also, if you're on cancer treatments, that you see a change in the gut health before you get resistance. So there's a bit of chicken and egg here. Could it be that the gut health are then promoting resistance to treatment? Now, we know there's an association, but the cause and effect still hasn't been um, proven. Now, I talked about polyphenols or phytochemicals before. These are the chemicals. Everyone knows who knows me know I'm a massive fan of these. These are the things in food which give its color, its smell and its taste. They're largely absorbed actually in the large bowel, whereas, say, vitamin C and things are all in the small bowel. Now, the large bowel is where all the bacteria is. And if you have poor bacteria, you don't absorb your polyphenols. And 
Vice versa, polyphenols acts as what we call prebiotics, which uh, promote the healthy bacteria. So they, they work very much together. We know from lots and lots of research, if you eat lots of polyphenol or phytochemical rich foods, colorful foods, herbs and spices and things, you not only have a lower risk of cancer, but you have a lower risk of cancer coming back. So we've already said exercise reduces your risk. This is another way to reduce risk. Even soya. So please don't tell me there are still doctors out there telling people with breast cancer not to eat soya products because that is so old school. It's been proven now with two large meta-analysis that soya is healthy. And I think CRUK eventually, after 10 years of me writing to them every weekend, asking them to change their website, they have actually changed it. So they do encourage soya products, which is, uh, which is nice to see. Uh, no apology though, but anyway, that's a separate thing. Um, now, what about if, uh, could you boost someone's phytochemical intake and see a response? Now, this is one of the studies we did. People who know me, this is an old study now, 13 years old, but it was the first study to show that if you boost the intake of phytochemical rich foods, in this case, I won't bore you with the evidence, we picked uh, green tea, broccoli, um, pomegranate and turmeric. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that you, you take these foods in supplements, but when you do a scientific study, you have to use supplements because you have to objectify and measure the intake. And that showed that if you have low risk prostate cancer and you increase the diet with these foods, you have a lower rate of progression. And that was proven on MRI. So these foods now are becoming well known in prostate cancer. Most people with prostate will, will have heard of these foods helping them. That was 12 years old, though, that study, or 13 years old. So more recently, we've been looking at other foods which could help prostate cancer or looking at new food technologies which could boost the intake of these foods in a healthier way. And um, basically, over the last four years, we've got a scientific committee uh, working together and they've actually produced a new sup a supplement for the next trial, which has ways to boost the candidate phytochemicals within these foods. And you can measure them as well, which previously they weren't measured. You can do a minimum, um, you can have a minimum quantity of these candidate polyphenols. And also there's things like cranberry and organic ginger, which work as bioenhancers. They further enhance the absorption of phytochemicals, unlike pepperin or pepper, which can have drug interactions, this actually it does it in a more uh, friendly, helpful way. So this leads us on to our next trial, which is actually ongoing at the moment. We've got 75 patients in so far where we're actually using this supplement instead of the previous one. And um, I will be able to let you know the results of this probably next year. And in this study, we're actually looking at a load of other things like erectile function, urinary symptoms, MRI and strength, because we actually think that this combination could improve people's strength. And strength actually correlates with reduced risk of cancer relapse and reduced risk of of, of death of any cause. So it's actually very important to improve someone's strength. And that's what we're trying to prove in this study. So watch this space. Um, there was another uh, study uh, using supplements, again, in a, in a called the Tokyo Woman Study, which is nothing to do with us, actually. They just did it independently, where they gave these foods in a supplement, but uh, and they looked at people who had menopausal symptoms, particularly related to hormones, for breast cancers like aromatase inhibitors. And they saw there was a significant, well, small but significant improvement of symptoms. So of course, if you are suffering from menopausal type joint pains, hot flushes, mood changes, these foods would be very important. So really try to enhance the intake of these foods. But polyphenols aren't just in foods, they're also in, um, they're in essential oils. And this uh, side effect, quite extreme, can occur off. Some of you in, might have it. Um, it's called onchalysis, and there's lots of myths, such as using black nail volish, or people put their own essential oils, which actually can do more, more harm than good, because essential oils undiluted can actually cause more harm. Um, and we were quite distressed that there was nothing available to help patients with this. So we put together a scientific committee. Uh, I won't again bore you with what's in it, but there was a whole load of um, like African sage and things which have antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, um, antioxidative properties, 
And this is one of the trials we're quite pleased with because we gave half the people on Taxotere and other chemotherapies a placebo and half um, this intervention. And it, 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 it basically eliminated uh, oncolysis. So all our patients in Bedford, for example, get this free. And we buy it through our charitable fund. Um, the other thing, vitamin D, we know that vitamin D stops you getting rickets and uh, osteomalacia, but actually it's linked to you know, increased risk of dementia if you're deficient, pregnancy problems, cancer, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, and reduced risk of COVID. So, um, you know, vitamin D is very important. We're all heading for vitamin D deficiency during the winter unless we do something about it. Now, there's been lots of studies saying, well, sure, I'll just take a vitamin D supplement, but it's, they're not very good at increasing your serum levels. In fact, a lot of studies are, are being negative. And that's because you need a healthy gut to absorb vitamin D. If you don't have a, a healthy gut, you're going to be vitamin D deficient. It doesn't matter how much you take. So a lot of the um, supplements now with vitamin D, well, not a lot of them, the best ones have um, a probiotic mix with the vitamin D. So this is what I take and this is what I recommend to my patients to take a, make sure the vitamin D you take has a probiotic link to it. Obviously, the best way to get vitamin D is to go off to Lanzarote in December and, uh, you know, sunbathe, but I don't think that's available in East Anglia, Jane. Maybe that's something we can work on. Um, so how do we improve our gut health? Well, it's not just about food. Exercise improves your gut health for certain various reasons. Eating burnt food or unhealthy lots of meats damages it. Smoking and sugar. Bad bacteria love sugar. Good bacteria love these sort of foods, these polyphenol rich foods. So mushrooms, broccoli, beans, all of things which you think, oh, they're going to give me wind initially. If you eat those regularly, after a few days, the wind and the bloating disappears and then you get reap the benefits. And also you need to eat foods with healthy bacteria in them, such as um, such as, uh, you know, kimchi or sauerkraut or uh, mature cheeses. Is there a role for uh, probiotics? Well, I've already mentioned the role with vitamin D. There are some studies. Generally speaking, if you have good gut health, you don't need to take a probiotic supplement. But there are situations um, where, you know, after an alcoholic binge, so your Christmas party, good idea to take them the next day, traveling to different countries, uh, etc. There's not that many studies in cancer, however. Um, you know, we know that gut health is bad for cancer, bad gut, but, you know, can you take a probiotic and reverse it? Well, there's not many studies to show that. So one of the things we're looking at is say, well, could we do an intervention in cancer and just see if it would help? So we again, we got another committee together. We said, which probiotic and it's mainly the lactobacillus are the ones which are, have most of the evidence so far. So this was made for the study and it's now available commercially. So it's got all the things you need in a probiotic, vitamin D, prebiotics mixed in, delayed release capsule, etc. Now that was then used in our COVID study, which we did during lockdown, where we gave people a, um, we gave them the, the probiotic plus or minus a phytochemical rich food. And we saw a significant improvement in uh, cough, duration of pyrexia, hospital stay, fatigue, diarrhea, and other symptoms, including, strangely enough, peripheral neuropathy and the ringing in the ears, which uh, we're actually going to look at this supplement for peripheral neuropathy after chemotherapy as a separate, um, you know, because of those symptoms. That, that's going to be our next planned study. Um, so going back to the design I just showed you about. So not only are we going to give people the phytochemical rich supplement, we're going to now go randomizing an intervention with the probiotic against placebo, asking a separate question is could we get a response with this, but could we get a further response if we give a gut health intervention? And again, we'll wait for the results because up to now, there's no study showing that taking a probiotic will reduce your cancer risk until this one, where we'll see. So whistle stop tour, I, I'm not sure, I think that was about 20 minutes. Um, thank you for listening and uh, let's have a discussion and uh, find out all the things I did wrong or missed out. Brilliant. Thank you, Professor Thomas. That was really great. And it's it's really good to see all of the studies and the research that's going into this area. And um, 
yeah keep up the good work it all looks brilliant um fantastic so I'm going to hand over to Belle Winder now who's going to share a little bit about her cancer experience um and some things that she did um in relation to nutrition and lifestyle so over to you Belle Winder Right. Uh, thank you, Holly. Thank you, Professor. That was really uh, interesting, uh, useful insight. So um, thank you for having me and everybody attending. Uh, so my journey was um, I had a routine medical at work on a yearly basis and um, I had no symptoms. I, I could feel no lump. Uh, I was pretty well and there was no family history. So on that day, I went to have my usual medical bloods and everything done. And uh, because I was over 40 with the with the corporate world, with the private care, you can have a mammogram over 40. So I went along with a mammogram, completely oblivious to, you know, how my world was going to change that day. So, um, you know, they did a mammogram, then they decided to do a, you know, scan and after that, it's biopsy, and then uh, you know the the penny sort of started to drop, and um, because as you see the medical profession, they just started looking at each other, and um, when I asked what was wrong, they said, "Don't worry," and that was the worst thing they could have said to me. Um, and that particular day, my husband was with me, and um, you know I I had that devastating news, you know, when I was told I had breast cancer uh, by the consultant, and that was straight after I'd had my all my other you know checks done I thought I was going to just uh, you know come back for the results but um I was told no wait can you could you wait um, the consultant wants to see you mm -hmm. um my foot well, my world fell apart everything happened very very quickly um I had her two positive uh breast cancer on the initial biopsy they said my lymph nodes were clear so um, I had surgery within two weeks and the pathology results came back and it showed that 12 of my lymph nodes were also affected. So um, hence I had to go for an, back for another surgery to remove those lymph nodes, um, which um, I didn't have time to register anything because I, I just couldn't understand what was happening to me and my body. Uh, then I had eight sessions of chemotherapy, which um, had its own challenges, um, losing my hair, losing my identity, my feminism. Um, I was distraught. I was traumatised. Um, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to come out the other side. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Although everybody, I had so much support. Everybody kept telling me, you know, you're going to be all right. But um, I... Um, chemotherapy, the second four sessions out uh, of the eight, um, my body didn't respond very well to them. I, um, my hemoglobins went to almost zero. Uh, so I had uh, multiple blood transfusions to get me well again, which it did get me well. And uh, then after that, I had 15 sessions of radiotherapy. And um, after that, because my cancer was hormone receptive, I was put on tamoxifen. Uh, I was on tamoxifen about eight months, I think probably about nearly nine. And um, when I had another scan, they found another tumour in my stomach. So I went back for surgery to have that removed, but fortunate for me, and I am very, very grateful that it was benign, that tumour. Then I had more blood tests done and they said, now you're in the menopause. So I switched over to letrozole, the aromatized inhibitors. Um, it has its own challenges, but um, over the years, I'm like eight years now down the line. It, um, you know, I, I manage myself. Um, it's been a long road. Initially, I couldn't because my life was full of hospital appointments, 15 months of everything hospital. I just didn't have a life. I didn't think I was going to have a life. But... Um, as I was going halfway through my chemo, I um, I was a gym freak even before I had cancer. I was fitness five times a week. I was, a, you know, um, my husband looked at me in shock when I said to him, I need to get back to the gym. And he said, but you're on chemo. I said, I need to go to the gym. It was for my sanity. So um, I had a local gym. It was just a small ladies gym. And the lady, she was wonderful. She said, 
I don't want you to pay anything. She goes, if you want to come. I walked five minutes on the treadmill on my good week when I could get out of bed. Now, five minutes to everybody may not sound that long, but for me, it was a lifeline. And then I used to go walk around the park, hold on to my husband for 45 minutes. It, um, I was absolutely exhausted. I used to come back and sleep for 18 hours, but it was just what I needed to, to give me that positive mentality back. I know it's not for everybody. So gradually, slowly, I started looking at uh, what I was eating. I was pretty healthy. Uh, I'm not a big meat eater. Um, I eat fish, vegetables. So, you know, my plate's always colourful and it's the small bit that's the protein and you've got all the vegetables and balance out the fats and the, you know, carbs. So I started looking at the things and then I saw uh, a nutritionist from a charity and I said to her, look, I'm eating everything healthy. I, I you know, I don't know why, you know, I'm not losing all this what chemo weight. And uh, she said to me, um, keep a diary for me for a week and let me have a look at it. So she had a look. She goes, you are eating healthy, but you're eating, you're eating the wrong things the wrong way, if, that's, if that makes sense. So basically, um, if I was running to the gym, I'd just grab a banana and have the banana and go to the gym and have low, so much water. So A, too much sugar, first thing in the morning. Bananas are good, but not first thing in the morning. So I made some switches where um, I started to have uh, porridge in uh, half water and half semi-skim milk. And I used to add blueberries and strawberries, chia seeds. Sometimes I used to have uh, plain yogurt, low-fat yogurt with uh, with fruit as well, or make the porridge and uh, porridge and banana pancake to have later on. Lunch times, I started introducing like more protein into my diet so that um, I had, it was for my muscles as well, because um, as we all know with Letrozole, um, you know, you can, you know, it affects the bones as well. And I've, I have noticed that. So hence I do um, muscle, you know, strength training, training in the gym. But um, I don't overdo it. I, I, I know when to stop. So I would sometimes just go, say, go and do yoga one day. And that was like the that was the, like the meditation side of myself uh, to, to bring that calmness in me and uh, sort of reduce the anxiety. Um, and also, I was very angry at myself. I don't know why, but I was very angry. But I think I just needed to put things into proportion of what happened to me. Not so much why me? Why not my sisters? Why not my mom? Why not my aunts? Nobody, nobody in my family's had cancer. So slowly, slowly, I started having that positive vibes back to myself. And I changed. I always make sure that in my in my dinner or my lunch, I always either I have lean meats like chicken or turkey, or I might have fish like salmon, uh, sea bass, mackerel, and vegetables. And yes, sometimes I do have potatoes as well. But I think in moderation for me, it worked that I changed everything and I sought the help that I needed. Um, you know, sometimes I do get days I don't feel like going to the gym, but then I go for a walk. Or if I don't go out for the walk, I go, you know, we've got quite a big garden. So I walk up and down the garden. Yes, I put my coat on a day like this and I'll walk up and down the garden. And I, I do feel better, but um, it's, it's taken me a long time to come to terms with what actually has happened to me. And um, so I do do a lot of volunteering work uh, because my background's from the corporate sector. So um, I was quite a senior figure in, in one of the blue chip companies. And I traveled every six weeks to South America. Uh, maybe, I don't know, it could be stress, I don't know. But um, I went back to work for two years. My heart wasn't in it, my passion wasn't in it. I was very career driven previously. Um, I chucked my job in. And you know what? Yes, I, I know everybody can't do that, but it's the best thing I ever did. I ever, ever did. And uh, now I can do things I'm more passionate about. And I'm really passionate about um, not letting cancer define me, that you're still a person, 
you're still a wife, you're still a mother, you're still a sister. You you still have that identity. But I don't like when people say new normal. I look at life through a different business lens. Like lens, I see I don't sweat the small stuff. I know what's important to me. I know it's important for me to look after myself. And it's it's only me that I can do it because my body. And um, I self-advocate. So before, I don't think I did that. So if I do feel something's not right, I do challenge my medical teams. I do challenge my GP. So when I walk into my GP, he goes, oh, my God, it's Bell Winder again. I said, I don't come for little things, but if something's wrong, I, you know, I need to know. So, for example, I, uh, I had lymphedemia after two years, and I didn't have no lymphedemia. But when I went to see my medic, she, she didn't know what lymphedemia was. She had to Google it while I was sitting there. So I was pretty shocked, but I thought, at least she's helping me. And eventually she did get me to someone, a specialist, to have the lymphomatic drainage. And touch wood, it's manageable now. And I do, because I ex do exercise, it, it does manage. But I always say to some, uh, you know, when I mentor people that go through cancer, even in my old work colleagues, if something happens, they always ring me up and say, do you mind talking to someone? They've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. So I don't scare them. I, I talk to them about my journey. I share my journey because I want to show that inspiration. I want to show that, you know, it can be done, but everybody's journey is unique. So don't compare um, one day at a time, one step at a time. Look after yourself. If you can't look after yourself, ask for that help. There's always help there, you know, whether whether it's the medics, whether it's the NHS, friends, neighbours, family, you know, there's always someone there. And the charities are pretty good. I, I sort of campaign with a couple of the large charities and I also um, involved in research with um, Professor Tut at the moment at um, Institute of Cancer Research um, because chemotherapy is not it's not great. Um, so we're looking to find kind kind of treatments that go alongside that, that will help the patient. So um, that's my journey. And um, to, if you asked me six years ago to talk about my journey, I couldn't. I couldn't. So it's taken me a long time to come to that terms. But now, I, you know, you can't stop me now. So I just talk about when people ask me, I talk about it. And I don't scare people. You know, you. I think as long as you listen to them, and uh, you don't preach to them, you know, don't eat this, don't eat that. But, you know, gradually, because once you're diagnosed, um, you need to come to terms with that. And then everything else will follow slowly. And then you'll find when you look back, you will, you know, you will be in a better place. And it takes time because everybody is different. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Thanks so much, Valwinda. That was really brilliant. And I think you touched on some really important things there, you know, about listening to your body and and you know, it takes it takes a lot to to sort of accept the changes that happen to you and you know, taking it one day at a time and, and you know, adapting to what you can do even just day to day is so important, isn't it? You know, one day you can walk five minutes on a treadmill, maybe one day you can't, but um it sounds like, you know, exercise and, and diet and stuff has really helped you on your journey, which is really amazing to hear. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Ray and Jane now mm -hmm. and so we can take some of your questions. Thank you very much, Holly. Just just before we move on to the questions which have been put in the chat, I just wondered if Professor Thomas wanted to uh, react in any way to what Bal Winders said. That was amazing. A really good summary of how bad it is to get cancer, I suppose. But what you've really demonstrated is that you feel uh, a sense of empowerment for your own destiny. I mean, you know, they, there are people who've done exactly what you've done and relapsed and it's been awful. And, but statistically, you're more likely to not relapse and uh, feel better but it's not it's not easy so it's fair enough saying go for a run but as you say you go for a, a tiny run and you fall asleep for it. but you know it's it's an ongoing working program so that self-empowerment 
it has its own benefits, as you as you know. You know, it makes you feel like you're a bit more in control. Just one question: When you went for your lymphedema, did they tell you not to exercise? Because that was happening in the past. No, they didn't tell me to exercise. They uh, they actually gave me some, you know, like arm movements like this: bend down and dangle your arm, and you know, stretch okay, up. Okay. So they told me those, but they said to me not to um, lift heavy weights to lift yeah. them down well the, yeah this is something i was having, well i was fortunately working for macmillan on the uh, exercise committee and um, we managed to share the two trials which show that weights actually improve lymphedema um so um it, it's still a shame that people are getting the i mean obviously really big heavy weights which cause a lot of damage but weight lifting actually improved the generation of lymphatics which you obviously found out yourself yeah because, um, now, I do, now i do strength strength training um i i feel it, it my arm is touch wood it's it's much much better i haven't had a relapse because i had to go and have like 18 sessions of lymphomatic drainage because my arm was like double the size of oh. my other arm it was like something like something like a ton of bricks and i couldn't yeah. lift it but um, it's strange that it happened after two years and not straight away. Well, yeah, it, it often happens a bit later for some reason. Yeah. Well, well okay, done. Yeah. Thank Sorry. Thank you very much, both of you. I'll just rapidly run through the questions which have been put in the chat, Professor Thomas. The first is a question.